Drive today, we drive the India-bound Skoda Octavia and find out what makes the Nissan X-Trail exciting. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I am Soini Dath. If you've just taken a look at our teaser, you know it's a comeback car show of sorts. For starters, good news for Skoda fans in India. The Octavia is being brought back and Rohit gets you all the styling as well as the new features in this Octavia for starters. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the new Skoda Octavia. This is the facelift of the Octavia that was sold to us for a brief while in the Indian market. So what you get on this is these new headlights. So that is the new DRL signature. You can see that shape right there. And then you get the slightly different treatment that is given to the grille. You look at the mesh down below, you realize that there are some new design elements there as well. Now, in terms of the wheel designs, again, some juicy options, some interesting options to choose from. And the sport line is the one that we are looking at at the moment. So you also get these nice black accents. Again, something that we've seen with the Superb, for example. So the grill, the wing mirrors, the window line, all of that gets these nice black accents. So you have the privacy glasses at the back and when you look at the tail you see this nice lip spoiler again adding a brilliant effect the skoda lettering in the new skoda logo again done up in a gloss black same goes for the octavia and this color visually pops out so nicely you see that shark fin antenna right on top and in terms of the space well nothing has changed because like i said this is the facelift. So you'll see slightly different upholstery right on the inside. This is the sport line so it's got the sportier seats as well. So the seat automatically moves back so you get the comfort ingress and egress. It's got this nice fabric material, it's got a quilted pattern on it and these are really comfortable. We have been driving this car for a while, all morning in fact. These are electronically controlled seats. You also get this flat bottom steering wheel. All the door pads and everything is going to be very familiar to what we've seen on the Octavia previously. I really like the treatment for these door knobs. I think it's done quite nicely. The push button starter is right below the steering the moment you start the car the seats are again going to come back to their original position whatever you have set there's memory seating as well what you get is a fully digital cluster you get the temperature gauge and the fuel gauge on either ends of it there's this new screen with a very easy to use layout so you've got this style layout it gives you the range here it tells you which phone is connected either CarPlay or Bluetooth, you get the inbuilt navigation right here. If your CarPlay is connected, you're still going to get this inbuilt navigation. You don't get the, uh, the, Car the CarPlay or, you know, the Google Maps over here. Then this is your cameras. It doesn't get 360 degree camera on this particular car, but I'm, I'm sure that option would be there. Then you have a camera cleaner as well. You just saw that water being sprayed on the camera and then you have a wide angle view if you so need these are going to be dynamic guidelines and then you have parking sensors at the front and at the rear and this is for locking and unlocking the car this is for bringing up the climate menu where you can yeah you can make changes to the air conditioning the flow of it the fan speed etc you have heated seats on this particular model and that's about it. That's what is primarily worth talking about. You also get two USB-C ports. You get a wireless charging. This is going to be your gear selector. Right. And this is your parking brake, auto start stop, some space to keep your knickknacks, a cup holder right here, key holder right here, 
and of course some space in the tunnel console to keep your stuff. Well, we are hoping that the Skoda Octavia can bring some zing back into the premium sedan space. We'll take a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, we'll tell you more about the engine performance as well as the driving dynamics. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. Now, the India-bound Skoda Octavia will be offered with a 1.5-litre petrol engine, which will be mated to a 7-speed DSG automatic gearbox. Now, Rohit tells us more about the driving dynamics as well as handling of this car. I've said this in the past. Skodas are usually bought by people who want that slightly sporty edge over the competition, someone who wants that slightly more premium feel. And in that scheme of things, the 1 litre, it's a good engine, but the 1.5 is just the better engine. And that same engine is also powering this particular Octavia that we are driving right now. So this is the Sportline, not the RS. So what you get is about 150 PS of power, very similar outputs to what we get on the Slavia. Similar tune as well. For the larger vehicle that the Octavia is, it still feels more than adequate. You know, it doesn't feel like a compromise anymore. Of course, the RS is definitely something that you will absolutely love. But even for the additional length, even for the longer wheelbase, the bigger size of this vehicle, the 1.5 still feels quite nice. It doesn't feel like a compromise. It doesn't feel like it's just about adequate. It really performs quite well. So I have managed to drive this car on the highway, driving a little bit in the city right now. The economy figures, at least on what the onboard computer is telling me, is excellent too. Because let me remind you, it also comes with the cylinder deactivation technology. Of course, 150 PS sounds very humble when you compare it to the RS. But, you know, in real world terms, it just performs quite well. Similarly, the engine also sounds very humble when you compare it to the RS. It doesn't have the crackles and the pops that you get with the RS. But it's still a nice sounding engine. It's still a nice sounding motor. The way the engine performs on the highway, around some of the twisty roads, around some of the winding roads that I've driven, even on city stretches, the engine performs so well. Thankfully, we have that engine on the Slavia. The steering, as always, feels nice and precise, even in today's day and age where they're overly assisted by all the electronics. And I'm not just talking about the EPS, I'm also talking about the aid asset play, right? Where the steering is trying to center itself, the steering is trying to bring the car back in its lane, make sure that, you know, you're within your limits and not wavering here and there. Even with all of that happening, it still has a very natural feel to it. So be it mild curves or something nice, fast and flowing, the steering has a lot of connect and that's something that I really like. The visibility has always been great with the Octavia, even with the low riding sedan that it is. And that continues even with this model. I mean, it's just a facelift at the end of the day, right? So all that doesn't change. Ride quality has always had that firm edge, that typical European ride quality. And even on these roads where we are driving on the B roads, there are a few ruts, joints here and there. You can feel that firm edge. But it's something that I'm willing to live with for the charm of a premium sedan, for the charm of an Octavia. What's sticking out on the tunnel console is still that old shifter or selector. And we've seen with newer Skodas, they move to something very similar to what the Audi Q6 has. I'm not a big fan of that. This one still feels much nicer. In terms of the ergonomics, everything just falls very easily at hand. The screen is nice and easy to read. The layout is absolutely easy to get, come to grips with. So even if you are not a big fan of tech, even if you're not a big fan of new screens and touch screens, etc. If you're an old timer coming back to the Octavia, you will simply love how easy the screen is to use. And we've also had a chance to get a look at the new facelift versions of the Slavia and the Kushak that will come in. That new Slavia just looks definitely do need to do the RS treatment on that. That would be something. But coming back to the Octavia, the Octavia just drives so well, right? I mean, when you drive the Slavia and then you also drive the Octavia, you know why the Octavia is what it is. You know why the Octavia is such a popular model for Škoda. It drives quite differently than the Slavia. It definitely feels like an upgrade. It definitely brings back memories of what a premium sedan should feel like. 
at the moment the entire market is just moving towards crossovers SUVs sedans are something that we drive largely in the luxury segment and of course that's a different beast altogether those are different animals altogether but in that premium space the Octavia has always had a special place right it's always made that special place in our hearts and one drive in the Octavia just reminds you why it felt so special the handling the dynamics the ride quality the way it goes around even neutral bends tight bends fast bends you just know there is so much poise to the way the car drives and that is what i really love about the octavia so even if skoda doesn't find a lot of takers compared to say an suv or a crossover they still need to have an octavia in the dealership and i think that's simply how i'll sum up my thoughts the octavia needs to make a comeback well, it's time to head into our final break here on the show. But coming up on the other side, we tell you all about the newly launched Nissan X-Trail. Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. Now, the Nissan X-Trail has made a comeback into the Indian market in its fourth generation after a decade. Let's find out if it's worth the wait. A new Nissan has become a bit of a rarity on our roads these days, but the company says that things are about to change. But what has us more excited is the car that's leading this. It's the Nissan X-Trail, which is back in India after a gap of over 10 years. So can it shake things up? Let's find out. The Nissan X-Trail has grown quite a bit since it was last year, which makes this SUV hold its own in a segment where size matters. That said, there are flashier, larger options still. Similarly, the X-Trail takes a more restrained approach with its details, but the large V-shaped grille and the wide tiered headlamps make their presence felt. You have some neat practical touches like the closing air dam covers and a good 210mm of ground clearance. These go well with the simple shapes and the tall functional glass area. Nissan has broken from the norm and fitted the X-Trail with large 20-inch wheels. These give the car a fuller look and a good stance. Now, one of the things that Nissan is talking about with the X-Trail is its practicality, but what you have is not a powered tailgate, which is something you expect in a car in this segment. But once you open the boot, you realize that even with all the three rows up, there's a decent amount of space here. You can put, say, a small backpack or two here. And yes, you can also fold these flat. And that's when you have a fairly usable boot space. So yeah, you don't get a spare wheel, which we think will be a bit of an issue in India. But having said that, the load lip, as you can see, is flat. It's a flat floor, so big items. They're a bit of a lift, but once inside, they should be easy to fit. The styling here continues with that simple, unfussy theme with the mildly contoured bootlet and fairly catchy rear lights. Although full LED setup is missing here. Now inside the X-Trail, you notice that it has that typical Japanese sort of simplicity and practicality, even in the way the interiors look. Now, yeah, the design itself is pretty simple and straightforward. It's nothing extraordinary, nothing flashy, over the top, nothing of that sort. But yeah, the colors and textures really do make a difference. In fact, I would say that they are quite a highlight of this car. Now that also continues with the stitching and even on the doors, if you notice, the wearing texture, for example, the fabric inserts here, or even the stitching here, or even this sort of brushed wood finish. But again, what takes this experience a step further are the controls. For example, I'll just show you. Everything there's a physical control for. All the ACs are these big, chunky knobs that you can use very easily without being distracted. Same for the touchscreen controls, big, chunky buttons. This gear selector here, it feels really expensive to use with this electronic sort of action. And that also continues, as you see, with this nice damped action to the stocks and to these buttons on the steering wheel. The center console here has good space with its open lower section and the deep storage bin. You get both Type A and Type C charge ports as well as a wireless charger. Most controls here are well placed too. That being said, the door pockets could have been larger. In this context, the small 8-inch touchscreen feels out of place. 
It seems like the same unit that was used on the kicks 5 years ago and feels like such in practice. The graphics have been updated and it is a generally competent system that's easy to learn with its physical controls but the fluidity and responses leave much to be desired. In stark contrast to this is the 12.3 inch driver's display. This is easy to read and configure, information is easily accessed and you have some uniquely detailed gauges for the engine that add a bit more to the experience. Now the sense of quality that you find in the first row isn't exactly repeated here. You notice a few more scratchy plastics, more visibly apparent. But what you do get is some immense practicality. As you can see, this slides with quite a good degree of travel. And the same can be said of this part. It's a 40-20-40 split for this big section as well. It'll slide in a similar way. But what you also get is very comfortable angle of recline. So yeah, as you can see, I have more than adequate leg room, knee room. So even someone who's over six feet will not have a problem. And even headroom is really quite good with the sunroof too. And of course, with the sunroof and these large windows, you do have a nice big airy feel. But having said that, because of this practicality and because we're fitting a, an extra row at the back, this bench maybe could have been slightly Longer, that's not the case, so you, you sometimes do find that under thigh support could have been slightly better. Here are some of the notable features that you get on the X-Trail. Now you get doors which open 85 degrees in the X-Trail. Now of course a good use of that, it makes ingress, egress into the second row very easy. But another use for it is that you enter the third row. Now let's be very clear, this is not a full seven-seater, it's best described as a five plus two. As you can see, getting in is not very easy. You have to be quite fit. As you can see, if I leave a reasonable amount of space for the second row passenger, this is how much space I have. It's really not a very comfortable space. I have to tuck my feet deep into the second row of seats. These seats do recline. They're a 50-50 split. There is no ADAS, but you get fairly clear front and rear cameras, seven airbags, including a unique center airbag between the front passengers. There's also a limited slip differential for better control. The Nissan x is the first car in India to get a variable compression turbo petrol motor. This effectively changes how much the fuel mixture is compressed in the cylinder, so it can shift between a high compression ratio that helps efficiency or a low one that brings more performance at higher revs. In keeping with that, you also realize that this engine, it's not very noisy. There's only a thrum and vibration when you sort of start up, but after that it settles into a fairly quiet, linear idle. Now you already know that this has some serious output for a 1.5 litre motor, 163 PS and 300 Newton meters. And you'll be surprised at how it puts it down on the road. It's actually quite effective. It never feels too highly strung, too overstressed. Maybe that variable compression tech that Nissan talks about so much. There really seems to be some meat behind that, so to speak. It really does give you very linear performance just off idle even. In fact, sometimes you might find that it's a bit too energetic off idle, especially in start-stop traffic, where maybe you will want to switch into the eco mode just to sort of tone down the throttle response. This has also to do with the 12-volt mild hybrid system, which Nissan says will add up to 6 Nm for 20 seconds to fill up gaps in the powertrain's stock delivery. In heavier traffic, it's not too intrusive with its start-stop function. Nissan says this can improve efficiency by up to 4%, but we will have to spend a longer stint in the X-Trail to find out how this and the new engine tech affect its mileage figures. Now, a big part of how linear this car feels also goes to that CVT gearbox. Of course, you have drive modes and they do alter, you know, the usual the steering feel, the throttle response and even the shift quality, so to speak. But what is really surprising is how well the CVT works. If you aren't too accustomed to CVTs, you'll probably find it quite difficult to even know that it's a CVT. So you do notice that very rarely, very rarely there's that rubber band effect, but in regular driving, you have that smooth, seamless performance that you want from a CVT. And another great touch is these paddles. Now, in some other cars, these paddles, they really are only ornamental. They don't really do much, but as you can see here, it's really giving you that engine braking. It's really giving you that added acceleration. So 
In that respect, it really does feel like maybe a top converter. We didn't get a chance to get deeper into how the X-Trail handles, but you do find that the wide tyres give it a good sense of grip. You can feel confident over fast sweeping turns. The body movements here are also linear, but you also have a sense of the car's mass, given that this is a tall SUV. The LSD also probably helps with this sense of control, but we would have liked for a more connected feel from the steering wheel. It's quite light and shrinks the car around you in traffic, which is great, but you don't find it to be too communicative at higher speeds, even though it does seem to get heavier. But here, what you do notice that, again, at highway speeds, it's very steady. It's, it's got that steady, long-legged feel to it. So we've been driving for a few hours. We aren't really tired. So long-distance trips will not be too much of a bother in this car. Now, the 20-inch wheels, yeah, they, the few bumps that we've encountered, yeah, there is a firm edge to it. You do feel the bumps, but it is rounded off to a certain extent, but of course, not as good as, say, a 19-inch. The Nissan X-Trail, like before, brings with it a fresh execution of what a premium SUV can be like. The cabin is great in the first two rows, as much as the opinion might be split on how useful the third row is. The cabin's rich ambience, despite some notable feature lapses, is also a win for Nissan. The powertrain also seems more effective in the real world than on paper, but we hope Nissan gets its pricing right in a segment that has some strong established brands. Well, we've run out of show on this week's episode of Overdrive, but remember you can stay in touch with the team through our various social media platforms and you can write to us on Instagram as well. We'll see you next week. Until then, drive and ride safe.